My name is, is David Williamson Schaefer. I'm a professor in the Educational Psychology Department. Um, the work that I'm going to be talking about um, was built mostly or was done mostly in our epistemic games lab, although it's important to note that as in all this, the work in these fields, we have collaborators in the School of Engineering, um, at other institutions, including um, Art Gracer at the University of Memphis, um, sta uh, some statisticians at the University of Georgia, and, and so forth. So I'm, I'll be presenting this work as a, as a package, but it's obviously a collaboration among a number of people. Um, so as someone in educational psychology, uh, what I study primarily is this, places where people learn. Um, and as someone who's particularly interested in technology and education, I'm interested in the impact of technology on environments like this. And of course, anybody who follows the news these days um, has heard all about the latest craze in technology and education, which is essentially to take this and do that. Um, and I think that the appeal, of course, is that if you record the same old lectures that we've always been giving, um, then you can make them available to thousands and thousands of people. And the idea that uh, if 10,000 or 100,000 people see a lecture, it's somehow more exciting than if just one person or uh, just a class full of people call it. So uh, um, I'm, of course, talking about uh, MOOCs, uh, massively open online courses. Um, and the interesting thing about this is if you actually stop and think about the elements of this idea of a MOOC, most of them don't make that much sense. For example, MOOCs are supposed to be massive. Well, there's actually nothing really new about the idea that you could, at a distance, educate lots of people. We've had correspondence classes for a hundred years. People used to use the post office rather than the, uh, um, uh, rather than the internet, but it was more or less the same idea that you took a set of canned materials and you sent it out and lo and behold, everybody could be educated. Um, the second piece, of course, is that it's supposed to be open, which means, in this case, free. Um, Again, before you put too much stock in that part, uh, we're already seeing articles like this. It says, Coursera jumps the shark, which is an English expression for uh, finally gets to the point of being ridiculous. Um, so it turns out that Coursera, which has raised something like um, uh, $10 million, right, is discovered that there isn't any money to be made in giving away courses for free. So instead, they're going to compete with Blackboard, which is a company that pervades that sells software to be used in face-to-face -face courses, and surprisingly, they sell it. Um, so, so much for the open part. Um, online, well, the argument there would be that all these things that were true before are changed dramatically by the fact that we have a new technology. And again, that may be true, but you know, we've been given people have been selling DVDs with courses with lectures from great professors for many years now as well, and that doesn't seem to have trans fundamentally transformed the educational marketplace. So they could be available on YouTube, and those are easier to get than the DVDs, but again, if you're paying for them, you're paying for them. So, um, and then, and the, but the final thing, of course, is that these are fundamentally courses, right? That is, they are the same traditional model of education that's simply been recorded and then distributed. Um, one of the interesting things that, that we're seeing is as people are responding to this idea of the MOOC, right, what, we're, what we see is the MOOC has become this kind of standard and so now as people talk about alternatives and things that we should be do, do better, they're always they're being compared to the MOOC. So for example, we see the DOC, which is a distributed open collaborative course. So we're arguing now about whether we should, it should be uh, massive or distributed and so on, right? So that we, it's sort of this wordsmithing at the edges. A colleague of mine released a, something called a BOOC, B-O-O-C. I forget what it stands for, but it's a MOOC that's built with better principles or something like that. Um, and the, the, the issue here is that these are all still courses. And courses has a very particular meaning in this context because what a course means is a particular pathway through material. A course is built on the idea, and here I'm taking the uh, uh, progressions from the common core standards in the United States, but the argument is general. The idea of the course is that you start with something fundamental, in this case it's counting and cardinality and operations in algebraic thinking, and you progress towards something that's supposed to be more complicated, so expressions and equations and functions. And what I'm going to argue today is that that particular choice of organizing the curriculum is actually based on a particular piece of technology. It's based on this technology. 
And the reason that matters is because we now have a different technology that we can use to organize information and structure learning. Um, to see why that's important, <laughs> let me just sort of describe a, the fundamental difference between the pencil and the computer. And it's that what, a, what writing does is it stores information. What a computer does is it manipulates information. If you prefer the language of business, writing outsources memory. I write something down so that I don't have to remember it anymore. I write it down on a list because the list is very good at remembering things and I'm very bad at remembering things. Uh, I'm usually often where the list was, which causes a whole other problem. But um, Computation outsources thinking itself. And let me give you an, a quick example of what I mean by that. So I made this slide in um, Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, and when I did, when I made the slide, it didn't look like this. It looked like this. And those of you who are familiar with Microsoft products know that that little squiggly line, red line under a word, means that the word is um, not spelled correctly. Uh, because ironically, Microsoft Office doesn't recognize outsources as a properly spelled <laughs> English word. Anyway, there's nothing particularly magical about the way that it does that. It simply looks at every word that I type and compares it to a database of words. If it finds the word with some rules about how endings work in English or Swedish or whatever the language is, um, it marks it as spelled correctly. And if it, it uh, doesn't find it, then it marks it as incorrect. Um, now, there's nothing particularly uh, profound about this except that I make my living with words, and I'm a terrible speller, which means that either I have to put up misspelled words for people to see, or I have to look up every word, or I have to pay somebody else to do that for me. But now I don't have to do any of those things because the machine does it instead. In other words, what computation does is it outsources simple thinking so we can do more complex thinking. And that has huge cognitive and pedagogical implications. Let me give you an example of that. So this is the example for extracting a square root. Um, usually I do a, do a joke here in my talk that I won't be testing people on this later, although in this room I probably could and you'd do just fine since I'm at a technical university. But um, uh, most of you have probably never seen this. Um, and if you had, you probably never used it. Um, I actually discovered it when I was teaching in Nepal, uh, where it's included, well, at least when, was when I was teaching there, it was included in the textbooks. This algorithm hasn't been included in textbooks in the United States, and I suspect in Sweden either, um, for at least 100 years. And the reason is because beginning about 100 years ago, slide rules were widely available in the United States. And it turns out that slide rules are a lot better at extracting square roots and doing a whole bunch of other things than the hand algorithm. Um, but in order to use a slide rule, you had to understand something about logarithms. Right? And in particular, you had to learn to read a table of logarithms. And there was one particular skill that I'm looking around here and probably maybe a third of the people in this room learned in school. And that was interpolation, which is just a fancy word for how you figure out what number to use when the number you want isn't in the table. It's really tricky. You take the number above and below, you add them and divide by two. But in any case, this skill of interpolation is key to being able to use a table of logarithms. Um, those of you who did learn it probably learned it in trigonometry class or its equivalent on the principle that while you were learning the tables of sines and cosines, you might as well learn the table of logarithms because interpolation was this general skill. It turns out that in trigonometry class, this isn't taught anymore. And the reason it's not taught anymore is because instead of slide rules, people use these. And now for about 99 cents anywhere in the world, you can go into a drugstore and you can buy a calculator that has this button, which is the button that finds a square root. And so now all of that pedagogical activity that in Nepal was an entire hand algorithm similar to long division that turned into reading tables of logarithms and tables of signs and interpolation has now become essentially something that we, take for, we can take for granted. For those of you who don't believe the 99 cents argument, just reach in your pocket and pull out your cell phone and you'll see that that button is probably there as well. Um, in other words, there was a time, right, when everybody had access to only one computer. It was the computer that was in their head. And so pedagogically, what you had to do was take that computer and you had to program it first, bit by bit from the ground up, in order to be able to do something more complex. That's why if you look at, for example, the court progression of courses in mathematics, <laughs> this is from a college in the United States, right? in order to get to statistics, 
which is something that's not that hard to do if you have a, a computer. You first have to take arithmetic and algebra and algebra again in pre-calculus. It's five courses in before you get to statistics, which arguably is one of the most important things that somebody as a citizen would need to know in order to say read a newspaper or make an informed decision. Um, probability, which is statistics near cousin, you actually have to take the same first three courses and then three other ones, including calculus, before you can get to a course in probability. But anybody who plays a game or uh, reads the newspaper is dealing with questions in probability all the time. And the idea that somehow you would have to take seven courses in order to be able to understand it made sense if you had to learn all of the mathematics that led up to it first, but doesn't make much sense if you actually have a tool that does that. In other words, pedagogically what we do is we start with these uh, things that are relatively simple, we build up to things that are more complex, and then eventually we get to the real problems that are interesting and challenging and important um, for people to solve. From the student's point of view though, what that means is they start with something simple, you get to something a little more complicated, and then somewhere along the way you say, wait a minute, why am I doing this? This doesn't seem to have relevance to anything. And as a result, by starting with the details, the students never actually understand the big picture. But with a computer, we can actually start with the big picture and work our way back towards the details that underlay it because there is more than one computer that, is, that somebody has access to. And as it turns out, kids are really very good at dealing with the big picture of things. They're interested in how the world works around them and how people solve problems. They like playing different roles. And now what we can do is go from those roles from games that embody those roles into the details um, that, uh, that make those roles work. And now, instead of having to start with one set of details and branch out to many different possibilities, we can go the other way. That is, there are many possible routes that one could take to the same details, whether those are details about science or mathematics or the arts or, or languages and so forth. And each child can actually find one or more ways that he or she connects from some thing that matters in the world down to the details. Now let me give you a very pragmatic example of how this might work. Um, so this pie chart represents a, a big problem that we face in the United States. Here's the problem. This, this, uh, the whole chart represents all undergraduate engineering majors. And as you probably know, we have a shortage of engineers in the United States. You probably have something similar in Sweden in, in engineering and many other technical fields. This orange part represents women in undergraduate engineering, who are the largest underrepresented minority, essentially, in engineering. And there's data that suggests that uh, what happens is, um, between the first and second year is the biggest drop-off in uh, women's participation in engineering. So they start off, as men do in the first year of their engineering curriculum, a bunch of them drop out after the first year, and then after that, their completion rate stays about the same. In other words, this drop-off is a big problem. One way to think about that is that the reason that people have showed up in that course in the first place is that these people want to actually design things. They want to be engineers. Right? What they get instead is this. They get a lot of very advanced, but still essentially for the purposes of engineering, fundamental math and science classes. Now, technologically, we could solve that problem by doing this, but that really isn't going to address the issue. Instead, what we should do is look to a different model of technology. So what we've done is looked at the technologies that people really use in the workplace, and we've built a simulation system, a game system, based around that. Here's how that might work. I'm going to show a short video and then I'll, I'll unpack the whole thing for you. Nephrotex is a computer game in which students play the role of interns at Nephrotex, an engineering company that manufactures membranes for dialysis machines. The work begins when players get an email from Alex, the design team leader, a fictional character in the virtual internship who requires them to design a filtration membrane prototype. To get started on the design process, we conduct some research on one specific material used for filtration membranes and the specifications that internal consultants within the company care about. Players use FEEDS, the form for electronic experimental device simulation a tool which allows them to create and input experimental devices that get sent to a testing lab. 
interns cycle through the engineering process by designing, building, and testing devices. Players team up to determine what the internal consultants of the company find acceptable. Then they regroup to develop a final prototype. When designing our prototype, we had to try and meet the internal consultants' thresholds and also determine in our teams which attributes were the most important and justify all our design decisions in our engineering notebook. After agreeing on a final prototype, players prepare a presentation that justifies their design choices. It definitely helped me understand the process that like, an engineer goes through in developing new technology. Along the way, players can communicate with live design advisors using a built-in chat tool. Design advisors model how professional engineers work, help the players when they get stuck, and push players to reflect on their work. Nephrotex has been played by students from ages 16 to 18, both in high school classes and freshman engineering introduction classes in universities. It kind of gave me a little more push to join with engineering because I know that it can be difficult, but by kind of seeing, you know, what I can get to what I can be doing, I, it just makes me want to do that much more. So my claim was that along the way to solving the big picture, right, you get the, you can get these smaller details and that's, what, what's that about? Oh, that's what it's about. Um, and that's true. So we have the, in the game, there's a, a intake interview and an exit interview for the internship and we're able to ask content questions and demographic questions and those kinds of things. One of the questions is about how you would design an experiment to determine membrane fouling, things like that. And lo and behold, from before to after playing the game, students understand how to set up an experiment better and, how to, and strategies to prevent membrane fouling. I guess that's not too surprising if you spend half a semester working on designing a dialysis membrane that you learn something, right? Um, but we also looked at their uh, commitment and confidence in engineering. And for the players in the game, we found well, basically no change, which doesn't seem very uh, compelling until we compared it to the control group, which actually goes down. So the standard is that people become less confident and less committed to being engineers. If they actually have this experience of working as an engineer in a simulated system, that, uh, that effect goes away. And in fact, if we look at women in particular, uh, women who came in with high confidence do about the same in both conditions, but women who were not that confident to begin with tank under the normal circumstances and they actually get more confident in uh, the game. In other words, it did what it was supposed to do. Um, the way that it does this <coughs> is by uh, designing the uh, pedagogy around what we know about how it is that people learn to solve problems in real world situations. Um, and what we know about professional thinking is that it's based on this idea of reflection in action, which is a term, for, term from Don Schoen at MIT. Uh, that he coined in the 1980s. And the idea of reflection and action is that it's thinking that reshapes what we're doing while we're doing it. In other words, professionals, people who solve problems that don't have standardized answers, are able to link the things that they know with the things that they do. And this link gets created in a practicum. And here you can think of internship and residency for doctors, moot court for lawyers, capstone courses in architecture or, or I'm sorry, uh, engineering or journalism, a design studio for architects. These are all places where somebody who's training to work in a field has an opportunity to take action, to actually do some work, but then to step back and reflect on that action, to talk about what worked and what didn't and why, to think through the problems, to debrief with uh, peers and with mentors. And this process of action and reflection on action as it alternates creates the reflection in action of the mature practitioner. Um, <coughs> Which means that what we can do is simulate this process in the computer game. So essentially what we do is we take the actions that are going to take place in the, in the simulated practicum and we link them up with the reflections that are appropriate to the domain by studying the domain. In order to do that, the uh, students have to have access to some appropriate tool that allows them to perform that, those actions. And they have to have access to the people that they need for the reflection on those actions. Uh, the technical term for this from education is, of course, an activity system or a participant structure. It's a configuration of resources that you use to solve particular kinds of problems. Um, in terms of the game, we construct this as a series of rooms. 
So a series of rooms is a series of activities with the resources incorporated and a particular goal and the reflective activity that ties it together. Um, now the way that that gets implemented in Nefertex uh, <coughs> is that is through the interaction between the uh, students who are uh, who are playing the simulation and uh, the mentors who are on the back end essentially acting like the Wizard of Oz controlling this simulated system. I'm just going to zoom this in a little bit because it's uh, doesn't it's the wrong screen wrong proportion to fit on the screen. Um, so here you can see. This is the actual rooms of the game that the mentor is moving the students through. Each of the rooms is divided into a set of activities, an introduction where you kind of figure out what it is you're supposed to do, a sandbox where you have an oppor uh, uh, opportunity to explore, the product that you produce, and then the work log which represents the reflection on that activity. Um, so for example, here we can see that, uh, that there are uh, five different groups that this mentor is working with, although for purposes of the demonstration here, there's nobody in most of the groups. There's just w the one person I'm going to do this little demo with. Um, and that person hasn't said very much. So the mentor can uh, click on the, on the user and they come up with a set of uh, situation, specifically, situation specific appropriate responses. In this case, if somebody's just sitting in the introduction for a long time, um, the system suggests that they go check the email, check their inbox for an email from their boss so they'll know that, uh, what they should get started on. So that's what happens and the chat gets sent. Um, then the user asks a question. They're, in this case, they're confused. What do they need to do in order to complete this report? And again, if the mentor clicks, there are situation-specific um, uh, uh, answers that they can choose from. They can edit and send them or they can just send them. In this case, they're just going to uh, send it. And now we see that the, play, the player in the game has gone on and done the work, and then this little bell indicates that they've, su that they've submitted, a, submitted their report. So now the mentor can pull up the report um, <coughs> and see what was submitted and decide whether or not it meets the appropriate criteria. If it does, then they send in the email that says the boss approves it, and if not, then they can say that it's not acceptable, which in this case it wasn't. Um, on the player side, they get an alert that email has come from their supervisor. When they read the email, you can see in this case it says the entry is incomplete, it didn't summarize the documents, etc., etc. The specific details of that probably don't matter so much here. Um, now in this case, the response of the player was to send an email back to the boss saying, can we discuss this? Which in some circumstances would be appropriate, although since the boss just said, talk about this with your mentor, don't talk about it with me. The mentor gets an alert that says they were, the player was sending the email to the boss, and the suggestion it says this is what the email this is the email that was sent, and here's what I suggest is the response, which in this case is the boss forwarded this to me. Please don't pester him. Come talk to me about it. Um, all of that is is essentially um, all, uh, laid out. All of those uh, conditionals and so forth are laid out in what is basically a text file that describes each of the rooms and all of the situations that are coming up in the rooms. So for example, here's the rule on uh, emailing the boss and how that gets, how it, and how it is that that's supposed to get responded to. Down here is the question that we saw about external resources. So if the player says, I, what is it I'm supposed to do with these external resources? Here's the suggested answer or answers and so forth. You guys have probably all seen systems like this. Here's the assessment. Here's the assessment portion. And what the rooms do is they allow us to contain the set of possible things that could be happening so that we don't have a completely open-ended world where the players could be doing anything, but we still have the opportunity for players to be interacting with each other and interacting with resources um, in a way that's not completely scripted. And so that, that the series of rooms is sort of a series of open-ended activities. Um, the, <coughs> the other thing that we've implemented is the ability to have reflective discussions, since those are, of course, a key part of this action and reflection on action. Um, in this case, when the mentor starts a discussion, the chat window becomes larger so that the players focus on it, and the mentor gets a set of particular targets. So in any given room or any given activity, we pretty much know what it is that supposed to, the key points are going to be. We don't know exactly what every player is going to say, but if you've just been doing one, uh, doing in this case it was an activity where you were trying out um, different surfactants on the membrane to see how they work. Well, we kind of know well, that 
they're going to be saying no surfactant was best overall, or they should be saying that, that they're going to be saying something about the fact that they were weighing these different choices to choose which one was going to be the best because no one was perfect, and that they were going to need to conduct more research in order to make a decision. So these targets are there, and for each target, there's a set of prompting questions that the mentor can use in order to get the players to start the conversation. Um, and again, they can edit or and send that. In this case, we see the players actually making a pretty good answer to that question. The question was, based on your analysis, what did you find out from your graph? Well, I noticed there really was no surfactant that got the highest score. The system is able to see that and actually automatically tag that that target has been met. In other words, somebody in the conversation made that point already, and it knows who made the point. So as a result, that's, that person is no longer on the list of people that you would necessarily want to direct questions to. So you can sort of make sure that everybody is engaged in the conversation. And then at the end, the system automatically generates what's called a revoicing of the conversation. So a kind of summary that says, here's what I heard, did I get that right? So in this case, it says, if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like no surfactant performed best. But then it also talks about some other things that you might have talked about from the targets that weren't met. In other words, it's a way of taking the kind of interaction that you would, the debriefing interaction, and systematizing it um, and automating it so that a mentor can actually handle five or six conversations going on at once. One of the things that our, we didn't have this originally, one of the things our research showed was that it was very hard for the mentors to keep track of which parts of which conversations had, were complete and which ones weren't. Um, and again, you can see this is all just implemented in the same, it's an Excel file. Um, so here, for example, is the, are the uh, questions and the, the targets and the questions that I was just describing. Um, this is the, uh, the target itself, um, and this is actually the description of the target in terms of the modeling language that we use. Now, obviously, in order to do that, we have to have a way of coding this, this discourse in, in terms of the domain. Um, so we have to have a semantic coding. Um, and obviously, anytime you're involved with semantic coding, you run into the AI complete problem, which is that it's pretty much impossible for a system to know everything that might, that, uh, might be said. And I will, come back, I will come back to that later. I'm just going to, let's just bracket that for a moment. Yes, I know I have to talk about the coding. Um, there are two other features that I can't show you because uh, they're, they're not going to be online for another three weeks. We actually, we just released uh, two games with this system and it's for older kids that, uh, where you don't, the mentors don't need as much help monitoring them because they don't make as many mistakes. For younger kids, there are a couple other features. Um, one of them is called the answer cache. So one of the things we discovered is that um, a thing that really good mentors do when somebody asks a question is they say, can anybody, does anybody know the answer to that question? In other words, they don't answer it right away. They see if anybody else has the answer. The problem is that if you're trying to manage five conversations, the, uh, the load to you of putting on your stack, your mental stack, that this question has been asked and that you have referred it back to the group and that you need to monitor the group to see if the question was answered is too high. So what even good mentors were doing was answering the questions right away because they wanted to make sure the answer got into the, got into the, the discussion. Um, so what the answer cache does is let the mentor choose the answer and then, hold, and then it holds it. So the mentor says, here's the, here's the appropriate answer. The system, instead of sending that, says, can anybody answer Sven's question? Right? And then it listens to the discussion and if it doesn't hear something that's semantically equivalent to Sven's question, it releases the question after a minute or so. Or sorry, releases the answer after a minute or so. Um, so essentially, it, it allows the mentor to not have to track that over five different conversations and potentially multiple questions. Um, the other thing is uh, just a, a relatively simple auto-assessment system. So you saw that one of the things the mentor has to do is assess the products. In, for, the more, for the older students, that actually works pretty well because something on the order of 95% 90, of the products are acceptable, so it doesn't take much work. You just click through and you go, okay, that's fine. When kids are younger, their products are, they have more problems. And so what, we, what the system does is a very simple, if you imagine the sort of product stretching from perfect to completely terrible, we set a threshold somewhere up here Right? And all the ones that are clearly just fine, the system automatically responds to. And then the ones that are either in the gray area or have a real problem are the only ones that the mentor has to deal with. So even if you cut down the number of things that you have to answer by 35 or 40 percent, that's still pretty significant if you're working with four or five groups. Um, the other part, of course, in the system is the simulation, the internal simulation itself. Right? So somehow you have to be able to actually do this kidney dialysis membrane design. 
Um, and the video talks a little bit about how to do that. The thing to keep in mind is that um, every game has a simulation at its core. The game of chess, for example, is a very crude simulation of a battlefield. But every game has a sim is a simulation, and what a game does is it surrounds that simulation by a particular set of roles and particular rules by which you interact with the simulation. So in other words, there are simulations all over the internet and all over the world of science. I mean, physics simulations, for example. There's uh, <coughs> Steam, the, or, uh, uh, the company that, releases, that uh, uh, releases video games, for example, has a really high quality simulation of the solar system, which is great, except that there's, you don't know what to do with it. I mean, you can mess around with it, but there's no particular thing that you're supposed to do. There's no role that you take. You're not playing with it other than kind of your own free play. What a game does is sets constraints around that. Um, but one of the things that that means is that the difficulty of the game can be modulated in part by the difficulty of the simulation. And that simulation just has a particular set of parameters. In fact, we think of it as basically a manifold. There are a set of inputs to the simulation. In this case, I think it's uh, four, five different dimensions. And there's a set of outputs on other five different dimensions. Right, and there's, for each set of five inputs, there's a unique point in the space of the five outputs that uh, defines the state of the system along each of those attributes. In other words, what we have is a manifold. It's a path through a high dimensional space. And the shape of that manifold determines the complexity of the system. If you're trying to optimize the system, or at least satisfies the system, if the manifold is really complicated, then it's almost impossible to make any headway because you can't come up with a mental model of the system. If the manifold is simpler and the information that you have about it is sufficient, then it's easier to make that. And in fact, that's the way we design these things, is we actually run the mathematics of the manifold. It's an entire, the simulation itself is entirely known on our end, and we can choose the parameters of the simulation such that they are realistic, but they actually are playable. Right? So in this case, what you're looking at in the overall graph is the number of, of things that don't satisfy any of the conditions and then the number of things that satisfy more and fewer of the thresholds of the internal consultants. And that's, you want the design to look something like that and actually do the same analysis across each of the choices of parameters in the simulation because you don't want one to be obviously better than the others. Um, so technologically then, what we have is a system where WorkPro is the interface that you were looking at. There's email, there's chat, there are the reports that get, that, uh, the materials that students have access to. There's the work products, there's the notebooks. And all of this is essentially the interface that the student sees to the system. There are, of course, multiple students who are grouped together in teams, and the mentors interact through that dashboard that I showed you with each of the teams. The mentor dashboard, in turn, is controlled by a Java 7 server-based hub, um, which, which talks back and forth with a MySQL database, which is populated from the frame board, which is that Excel file that I showed you. Right. So not a very complicated system in some sense. Um, the things that we've added to that are, of course, this auto-suggestion feature, meaning that the system can actually um, monitor what's happening in the dashboard, and based on rules that are imported into the MySQL database, populate the dashboard with particular things that are appropriate to the situation. Um, then there's the domain simulation, which actually sits in some senses outside of the, of the system. So there's an API, there's a way that this simulation talks with the hub, but you could basically slot in any, si any simulation you wanted. The system doesn't, doesn't particularly care what's being simulated. There's some simulation you're running, it has a particular output, and then that gets processed by the, the by the students and written up in reports and so forth. Um, <coughs> now the, the thing that's particularly important from the point of view of learning is that what this system does through the MySQL database is create essentially a log file that records everything that's happened. Now again, I'm not telling anybody who's working in sort of modern learning technologies anything we don't know, log files are all the rage. Um, which means that we have to have some way to act on that log file um, which is what I'm going to turn to next, and that is, th in this case, there's an, a plug into R, which is an uh, open source statistical package, and then with that are, is the coding and analysis rules, and that's, what I, that's the piece that I need to explain next. Um, before I jump to that, let me just make the point that sort of the game engine is actually all of these pieces, and as you can see, you could design another game by simply specifying different, a different scenario in the frame board, plugging in a domain simulation, 
Obviously, for each domain simulation, you would need particular coding rules that might be unique to the domain. Some of them actually are unique and some of them aren't. Um, and then you have to recruit the mentors. But that whole system, um, the, the rest of the system is in place. And obviously, one of the things that we're doing is tracking what the mentors are doing and using that to improve the rules in the, in the framework, which then reduces the role of the mentor. So you've just seen one or two iterations where we've built new, built new systems on top of it. Um, so the question then is how to think about the domain in which people are operating. And the uh, useful idea from uh, the, the study of learning for this is the notion of a community of practice. And the idea of a community of practice is that any group of people who solves problems that are complex, whether they're uh, lawyers or uh, electricians or plumbers or anybody, has a particular uh, way of doing things that identify them as a community. They have ways of thinking about problems, um, ways of going about solving answers, ways of communicating and so forth. In other words, a community of practice, a group of, um, of problem solvers, has a particular culture. Now what does it mean to say that a group has a culture? Well, it certainly means that they have certain shared knowledge, right? You actually have to know something to participate in a culture. And you have to have certain skills. But more than that, being part of a culture also means that you have to share a set of values and a certain identity. You have to see yourself as a participant in that culture. And that all of these things, skills and knowledge and identity and values, are tied together by epistemology, which is, of course, just a Latinate word, a Greek word, um, for a ways of making decisions and justifying actions. And this collection of skills, knowledge, values, and identity, in my work I've referred to as an epistemic frame. And it's a useful term because you can think about this collection of things like a pair of glasses. It's a pair of glasses that colors the world from a particular perspective. And depending on which community of practice you're a part of, you see the same things in the world in different ways. Um, and, and each of us has multiple frames in this sense. We have the professional frame we're in right now. When we go home, we have whatever personal frames we use, whether that's father or mother or sister or brother or, or whatever, um, and so forth. And so the idea is that these frames can be constructed, and they're constructed through, this, through a practicum. That's the job of the practicum, is to build this particular way of seeing the world. Now, the, the thing that this implies, of course, is that the skills, there are skills, knowledge, identity, values, and epistemology. But the key thing is not just that you have those, but that they're connected in some appropriate way. And so this gives us the foundation for thinking about how it is that we're going to um, make sense of the data that we're collecting in these log files um, and assess it for the purposes of understanding the extent to which somebody is really thinking the way an engineer does in the case of this game or whatever the, whatever the member of the communities of practice. So coming back to our semantic coding problem, essentially what we do is we start with these structural functional linguistic codes, so the skills, knowledge, identity, values, and epistemology, right? These are ways in which you are, in which the discourse is framed. And then we link those with particular codes for the domains. So in the case of Nefertex, carbon nanotubes, surfactants, data, design, professional, and so forth. Each of these, the structural, functional, linguistic codes and the domain codes, essentially have a complex set of keywords. Um, it's not just straight keyword coding, but it's, it's essentially augmented keyword coding. We use regular expressions, and you can use negations and so forth. But it's basically an, uh, an elaborate keyword coding system that is then uh, made conjunctive. So we have the codes for the uh, functional linguistics, structural functional linguistics, and we have the codes for the domain. And now we're allowed to look and, and, put, and place essentially a mask over it so that even if something is coded for, say, surfactant and values, there really is no value of surfactants in engineering. The surfactants are useful, but we don't feel like we should use them. We just use them if they solve some problem. So this is not a legitimate code, whereas engineering identity is a legitimate code. And what that does actually is it, um, it uh, drives down the type 1 errors, right? Because you have to make a type 1 error on both. I'm sorry, that's not, that's not the right way to put it. Um, <coughs> if I ha in order to get a type, it drives down the, the, drives down the fall. I always get this backwards. Um, basically, I have to make a mistake in both places simultaneously in order to get a, in order to get a mistake. And it has to be a mistake that is in one of the places where there's a, there's a conjunction, right? So in order to get a false engineering identity, I have to both falsely uh, identify it as being about engineering and falsely identify that it's an identifying, and that has to be something that survives the mask. So as a result, we're able to drive up our type 2 errors and the initial coding pass, 
That is, we can make our coding more robust at the level of the keywords because we're going to drive the error back down in the second phase. Um, anyway, all that's just to say, whoops, we can, whoops, we can actually get some pretty good Cohen, this is Cohen's Kappas, and these are actually old. The system's been, we've, we've tweaked it since the last release, so we can get even higher Kappas than that. The first column is the one between an expert and an autocoder, for those of you who care about those details. Um, but you can see, there's some up at 0.9, many of them are, oh, they're almost all over 0.6. There are a few of them that are problematic, and they're problematic for, for reasons that we've subsequently dealt with. In any case, what we get is then a translation of that log file into a log file that's represented in terms of the semantics of the domain. So then the question is, what are we going to do about that? And what we do is we take uh, the uh, chunks of the discourse, and we essentially um, construct an adjacency matrix out of them. So if this is one... Uh, portion of the discourse that we've coded, right? We look at the co-occurrences and we create an adjacency matrix. That adjacency matrix now represents the way in which the elements of the domain are talking to one another. If we accumulate that over time, sorry, we get a map that represents the structure of the underlying discourse. In other words, how it is that a particular player has been working in the domain according to those codes. Each of these matrices can be translated into a vector in a high dimensional space. We do a normalization and a dimension reduction. Right? And as a result, what we get is a representation now of the, a quantitative representation of the discourse that's been going on. What it is they've been saying, the actions they've been taking, all that stuff. Um, so if you remember, this is the finding that we were originally interested in, right? which was that some people, uh, some people wind up going down in terms of their uh, uh, commitment and confidence and other people wind up staying stable. Well, here's what the discourse looks across a bunch of players of Nefertex. Um, now, keep in mind that the way that these have been constructed is that each of these points is in, in fact represents a network in this high dimensional space because we've taken those adjacency matrices. Adjacency matrices are equivalent to the network representation. This is the network representation of that point. For example, <coughs> this is the net rep network representation of this point. Now, the thing to notice is that these network representations now let us interpret the underlying dimensions. So up here, right, that's where the networks for, towards collaboration are. Over here is design, over here is data. And what that means is that if we, <coughs> uh, if we look, we can see, I'm going to just filter this a little bit, so the red dots or the maroon dots are the... <laughs> Players whose commitment and confidence wasn't so good at the end or went down. The green dots are the ones, the players who did particularly well. So, for example, up here in the collaboration, the, the domain, the <coughs> people who spent a lot of time talking about collaboration, those are mostly the red dots. So it turns out spending your time talking about how we should all solve this problem together is not so good. People who did the best are actually sort of there in the middle, meaning they had a good combination of collaboration, data, and design, which is, shouldn't be too surprising. If we look, for example, here's a player who didn't do so well. Here's a player who did. Right? And so obviously the network is, one network is much more robust than another. And the nice thing about this technique is that we can actually look at that network and say, well, why is this player's network so robust? Let's pick, for example, this linkage between the skill of using data and, and making design decisions. What, how did that link get made? We can actually go back to the data and we can see all the different rooms and all the conversations this player had in those rooms and the way in which he or she made those links. Um, I, won't, I won't read them and I'm happy to show this to people uh, later, but here are basically the things that were coded for design and here's something that was coded for data. And as you can see, right, it's actually part of the same, part of the same uh, section of discourse. So those things were being considered together, meaning that the person was making, was making sense of them. Um, yeah, good. <clears throat> Just to return to our original uh, data plot here, one of the things that's interesting is that um, there's a bunch of research that suggests that uh, women are drawn to engineering because they like working with other people and they like to s make society a better place. Um, one of those kinds of research that fits nicely with everybody's stereotypes, as you might imagine. Um, and it, as it turns out, there's been a number of courses in the last five years that have been put together at schools of engineering that try and recruit women to engineering by having them work in teams to learn about all the social good that engineering does. And that actually was the control group for this experiment. 
So this was already somebody who was trying to solve the problem of women in engineering by having them collaborate to understand why engineering does such great things. Um, <coughs> Well, it turns out that one of the statistical differences in this data, which I can't illustrate for a technical reason that I don't entirely understand. I, there, was a, there was a bug in the latest and greatest but not public release version of the software I was using when I put this together. The women are actually less collaborative overall in terms of their actual discourse than the men are. Um, in other words, it may be true that in surveys that's what women say, but if you actually put them into the conversation, Right? They're spending less time talking about the collaboration um, than the men are. Um, interesting, interesting little outcome. So in other words, not only, was the con not only is the control hypothesis not as good as the hypothesis that women in fact want to go out and design stuff, um, but it isn't even true that women are, that, are as excited about uh, collaboration as the previous data suggested. The point that I'm trying to make with all this is that there's always been a tight linkage between content pedagogy and assessment, right? What we teach, how we teach it, and how we assess it. That's sort of the key triad um, that drives instruction. And for 150 years or so, this has more or less been the way in which those things have been orchestrated, right? What's been, what's hidden, what's effaced, what's not paid attention to is the fact that this particular triad depends, always depends on the technology that's being used right? and that the particular combination of these things that we have today is based on one particular kind of technology. What's happened is the core information technology of our society has changed and the response has been, well, probably less than transformational. And the reason I'm suggesting is because there's another piece to this that, we, that hasn't been considered as much as it should and that is the psychology of learning on which all of this is based. Right? The if the, as long as the psychology of learning is about individual pieces of things, about whether or not I know X or can do Y or care about Z in relative isolation, as long as we're using the psychometrics of the last hundred, and, hundred years or so, um, that's geared towards determining precisely whether or not somebody has one thing or another, but isn't interested in either the way they can use them or the way that that knowledge is related to any other knowledge, we're going to wind up basically back at the same lecture and recitation format because that's an extremely efficient way of getting people specific pieces of information that they can give back on tests of specific pieces of information. The only way we're going to change that, whoops, that's going the wrong way, is if we develop a different model of what it means to know something a model that's based not on the individual pieces, but on the connections between those individual pieces. Once we're looking at that structure of connectivity, the way in which the, the, I use information in action and relate it to other pieces of information, ways of making decisions, the other things that people are doing around me, that's the only way that we're going to be able to change the pedagogy that we use from something that focuses on lecture and recitation to something that focuses on real world problem solving. Because that's the only way we're going to be able to get an assessment tool that accurately captures the kind of complex thinking that goes on in real world problem solving. And that's the only way that we're going to move the content from the sort of ground up stuff that you learn one piece at a time to the top down, start with the big picture, understand how to solve a real problem and then progressively understand more and more of the details. Um, in other words, the transformation that we need is not just switching the technology and it's not just switching the, the delivery mechanism, it's actually a rethinking of the entire constellation of instructional mechanism. Um, now the, the term that we use in, in my lab for this is a macro sim, a massively adaptive complex realistic online simulation integrating mentoring. Um, we only use that because it provides a nice acronym, right, which suggests that what we're talking about is simulations on a large enough scale that they become significant. And the only reason we're doing that is because it's not a riff on the term MOOC. It's not a, it's not a transformation of the underlying idea that we're doing something to courses. What we're doing instead is actually reconfiguring the way in which we think about education um, writ large. And I think that's the power and potential of the technology that we have but only if we step outside of the, the existing metaphors. Um, so I'm going to stop there. 
Um, and I'll, I'm happy to take questions and discussion. We have, uh, yeah, I timed it about right. 50 minutes is about as long as anybody can listen to one person talk. And um, I'm, I'm happy to, to go into whatever detail people want. Uh, later today, uh, when I meet with uh, doctoral students in the, in the course, and I guess other people are welcome to attend as well, um, well, we'll probably dig into more detail both of the, um, the macro sim technology, meaning the tool that you use to create the simulations, and then also the, um, the network analysis that we use for the assessment. Um, and my hope actually is that the doctoral students will have a chance to play with that and perhaps uh, do some short inventing between now and tomorrow that we can then discuss in, in more detail. Um, to the talk tomorrow um, goes into more detail about the learning theory behind this, its relation to, to more traditional educational games. Um, it's designed, uh, I, I, <clears throat> I went sort of quickly into technical details here because I assume that at the uh, DSV you guys can handle that. At the education school I'll go a little more slowly through the network analytic part and so forth and, and talk more about the theory behind it. Um, but that having been said, I'm willing now to, to jump into um, any of those details. I don't seem to have a network connection, so there's only certain kinds of things that I can probably demo right now. Um, but I'm happy, to, I'm happy to either show stuff or just talk more about things or really uh, talk about whatever's on your mind. Or if you don't have any questions, I, I can keep talking, but I, I imagine that's probably not the most exciting thing at this point. Um, so let me stop there and, and uh, thank you. Thank you for those of you who are nodding and smiling especially. I always appreciate that while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> So any, any thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah, I, I could start out. Sure. Uh, I find this extremely interesting from several, several perspectives. But <coughs> one of the things I'm thinking of is uh, how do you go about sort of, I mean, because you have to rely on, you look into practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got sort of a this program and a mechanism to handle that, but you will need to define the various characteristics of what sort of what signifies basically being an expert mm. in a certain domain. And uh, so, how do you do you go about sort of defining that? Yeah. So, um, well, it's it's a it's a bit of an well, there's a, there's a few different answers to that. So, partly it's an iter iterative process, right? So you don't there's not just one moment where you do it, but um, we have a theory as to what's going to constitute expertise. So it's going to be a particular constellation of skills, knowledge, values, epistemology, right? Um, and we have existing experts, meaning people who are in actual practice. Um, so we can observe what they do, and we can observe it from a particular theoretical lens. We can also then try and take our best guess at, m at modeling what is in fact important from the perspective of epistemic frames in that domain and then we can ask experts to validate that. Mm -hmm. We can then build a, the, a syst the system or a piece of the system and we can have experts look at that. We can then have experts run through the system and we can trace what their trajectory looks like and we can compare that to novices. We can tweak the system, we can make changes at any point along the way mm -hmm. and so what we're trying to do is essentially tune this to and we have a, there's a practice in the real world, we have a model of that practice, and what we're trying to do is essentially tune the model. So very much like any scientific model, you know, what you do is you have a um, model zero, and then you test it against the reality and with whatever tests you can, you can use, and then you update the model. And eventually, you know, what the, the, <coughs> um, I'm thinking of an, an analogy to something that's, um, more complex mathematical problem that we just solved, where the answer in, in that case turned out to be the problem is not solvable in the general case, but in all cases that actually occur, it's solvable, right? So, it, in, right, in theory, it would, it's not possible to make sure that you can model every practice perfect, perfectly. In practice, though, it turns out that it doesn't take that many iterations to get something that's close enough that it works. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so let me give you an example, uh, sort of concrete example of that. So when we, with the one of the first simulations we built, um, meaning com computational simulations, was of uh, urban planning. Um, and those of you who know anything about urban planning know that one of the things that planners do, right, is that they talk to the various groups in the community and then they have to make proposals as to sort of possible planning alternatives and then they get feedback and so on. 
So one of the things we were concerned about modeling in the practice is that basically if you're seen as being biased as a planner, that makes your job much harder. Right? Because if, if there are three groups in the city, you're group one, you're group two, and you, know, you guys are group three, and group one feels like I'm always talking to the other groups, right? then they're gonna, be, they're gonna be unhappy and even something that they might like as a solution, they might be more resistant to because it's coming from me and they see me as representing these other people's interests. Ironically, we just had an urban planning thing happen on my block and that's exactly what happened to, the, to our older person. So the city representative was talking with the developer all the time and so the, the people in the community are, are uh, annoyed with her and at the project more than they would be because she's seen as being biased, right? So the question was how do you model that? So one of the things we looked at in the simulation was each time you asked for feedback, it would track who you asked feedback from and all the groups that you weren't asking feedback from would raise their, would raise their level of demands just a little bit. Right? So in other words, every time I talked to group one, group three would ratchet up their demands and so it would get harder for me to please group three. Well, <clears throat> so it turned out that, which is you know, a fairly crude model, but um, it turned out that the problem with that was if what group three's ratchet was really small, the increment was really small, I would never notice it as the planner. I, I, I didn't have enough information to be able to tell that because I had talked to this group three times, their numbers just got higher. If I made the increment big enough that I noticed it, then basically as soon as I talked to anybody, the game was over because everybody else was so mad at me that there was no way to solve the problem. So that's an example of the kind of, of, a kind of thing where it, it's a property of the real world, but in fact, at the level at which things were being simulated, it, it disappeared. So empirically what happens is the number of iterations you have to go through to get something that for the purposes of the simulation is good enough is not so large that it becomes an intractable problem. Now I suspect, as we were talking earlier, right, if, if what you were modeling was, you know, open heart surgery, the tolerances for errors in the yeah. model are a lot lower. Yeah. The amount of money that's available to do iterations is also a lot higher, so there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a balance. But that, that's essentially what we're doing, is we're just tuning the model. Mm -hmm. And we start out with, we have enough of a, uh, are you guys familiar with the term mechanical grip? It comes from Andrew Pickering. Um, the idea of a mechanical grip is it's the place where, so all phenomena in the world are, are kind of, have, are nebulous, right? Exactly what, they, what comprises the boundaries of them is, you know, is, is open to debate. The easiest way to think about that is if you open up, when you do a, a dissection and you open up like a, the frog, there aren't actually neat organs in there. It's all just goop. And like figuring out what the organs are is the first step to actually making sense in science. The idea of a mechanical grip is where, it's, it's where science attaches to whatever the phenomena is. And so you know, what we have is a theoretical mechanical grip that allows us to start asking questions and begin that, that <coughs> simulation process. And that's what the epistemic frame provides essentially. It's a kind of place to grapple on to what's happening in the practice to begin simulating it and then the rest of the tools, WorkPro and the rest of the macro sim, are simply a way of implementing that mechanical grip. Is that helpful? Oh, yeah. yeah. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> yeah, the semantic coding. Mm -hmm. Is it done by hand or is it done by machine? Yeah, it's done by machine. <laughs> we did it by hand once upon a time and um, my graduate students more or less staged a revolt. No, uh, it was just, it, uh, there's no way to do it quickly enough by hand to have it be of use for anything other than, you know, six months later saying, oh, this worked or it, or it didn't. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that's done on the, on the fly in the game. Um, it, you know, it turns out, so the thing about hand coding is it turns out unless you do a lot of training of raiders and they actually spend a lot of time doing coding, th they pretty much stink too. Like people, inter-rated reliability is not even that high between people for the most part. So the machine can do reasonably well. Um, it's funny, you know, there's a saying in English, maybe you have something similar in Swedish, uh, um, <coughs> almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Um, so horseshoes is a game where you, uh, you pitch something at a, at a stake, right, and you get points if you're the closest, even if you don't actually hit it, and hand grenades are obviously, right, bombs. Um, all right, so almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Well, it turns out it counts here too because, um, you know, we try and design, we design the system knowing that it's not going to pick up everything perfectly. 
And even the most perfect teacher doesn't pick up everything perfectly. And all we have to do is get it so that the people on the other end, we don't actually have to get them to believe 100% that there's a real person on the other end um, or that that person is paying perfect attention to them or any of those things. We just have to get it reasonably close. And what the data on um, automated tutoring, which is what this work is built on, essentially shows that if you have a really, really, really good teacher, there's almost no um, technical system that will do better. On the other hand, a technical system can do maybe as well as sort of an average teacher in a lot of situations and better than a bad teacher. Um, and so if you sort of set your sights appropriately, um, there, there's, you know, there, there's, there's some wind to be had. So the same thing is true of the coding, right? The automated coding system is imperfect. It's going to miss things. Um, ironically, one of the things that we find happens is, um, and this is fairly routine, if you, so the way you, um, I'm, some of you probably know, but I'll, I won't make the assumption that everybody does. The way you validate a coding system is you take a set of utterances and you have a, a per, you have two people code it and you have the machine code it. And then if the machine and the people do better than the two people do, you go, well, the machine's pretty good, right? Um, a fair amount of the time um, when somebody looks over, we then have a referee look over the machine codes and the human codes, and when they've disagreed, we say, well, okay, I don't know who coded which, but this is the right one. The referees agree with the machine about as often as they agree with the humans, and often more. Um, and it's in part because although humans are very good at using context to make sense of something, right, they often are also get confused by the context and start to overinterpret something. And so there's sort of a there's sort of a, a balance both ways. And there are times where, you know, if you say, uh, I'm, I'm I can't think of a good example off the top of my head. I actually should probably, I probably should probably have learned one for m moments like this. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there are times where somebody will be making a decision and they'll be referring to some piece of data. And if you read it really carefully, like, are they really making a decision based on that data or are they not? And if you sort of step back, you're like, no, they're, making a decision and they're using data. That's the epistemology of data, period. And, right, and the machine will see it that way. Whereas a person can go, well, they, there's all this stuff in between, is this really that? And, and sometimes that's uh, the appropriate way to look at it, but sometimes we overinterpret. Um, uh, that's a very long answer to a very short question. Did, was there something else you wanted to ask about the coding, other than that it was done by machine? Um, yeah, it was a bit fast, so the the assessment is based on the semantic coding. Yes. Yes. Right. So have you had any opinions from the students about that? Well, so, the, so, so far we haven't used the, <coughs> the, the assessment of the students in the course okay. is not based on those models. Okay. So, so far what we're doing is we're comparing other more traditional assessments to that assessment instrument to try and understand its properties. Um, so we'll compare, we actually had a group of seniors use the system and so we can look at what they did and compare that to the novices. Mm -hmm. And we can compare novices who did well on this part of the post test to the experts. You know, in other words, we're, we're trying to triangulate the system. So the, the students aren't seeing that directly yet. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, so the, and they probably won't for a while yet, the next thing to do will be to feed that back into the, back to the mentors and let them, let the mentors use that information as part of the decisions that they make within the system. Um, and then probably ultimately we'd get to this, we'd get to the students. There's enough other material in a course. I mean, they produce so much written work as part of this. Um, and it gets scored by the system that it's easy for the mentors to give them a grade. You know, if the problem is giving them a grade, that's easy not to do otherwise. So we haven't had to do that yet. And that would then sort of push it even further towards sort of tutoring systems and intelligent tutoring systems. Even. Yeah, I mean this, right. Yeah, yeah the, so the the way that this was proposed originally was that this is an intelligent mentoring system with the distinction being that this is an ill-formed domain. Mm. Right? So there's deliberately not a right answer and not even a right path to the, mm. to the answer. Mm. Um, so you could imagine, for example, that even if you had a group of experts, that there might be some experts who 
took one path to the solution and other experts took another path to the solution and that the solutions might actually not even be the same yeah. even though the way they talked about them might be the same. So what we're trying to do is provide a model of um, in an ill-formed domain, mm -hmm. whereas most tutoring systems are in a well-formed domain, right, mm -hmm. where you have a set of production rules and there's a right rule to apply at mm -hmm. some point in the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. the idea. You had a question? I think you partly answered, but I was thinking about how much you put into system, in the system, how to solve the problem or how to design a product or is it more neutral with designed? Yeah, um, well, so the, the game engine itself, meaning the work pro and the, well, if I, I think I can, where's my mouse here? Um, if I go back to the, here. Right, so the thi these things are relatively neutrally designed. Right? Whatever intelligence about the problem there is, is going to be here, here, and here. And presumably some of it's held in by the mentors themselves. So the system itself is fairly, the game engine is fairly agnostic. That having been said, since you're scaffolding people's progress through the problem, the, the content has to actually know a fair amount about what an appropriate way to solve the problem is. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> um, and then, you know, within each... I mean, the, the, the thing that was surprising to me, for example, um, is if you look at... Let me get my mouse back here. Um, I just want to find, there's one place where I show, here. So this actually, for those first two lines are, are what we call general scripts. So those apply in any situation. From line 64 to line 79, um, I think there may be one line missing at the, off the bottom, I don't remember, but, or two. That's basically a whole room where students are doing background research, meaning they're looking up materials that are in the, within the system, so company documents, and then they have to go out online and do searches. So a fairly open-ended activity, and they're writing up a report on how dialysis works. These are college freshmen, so 18 years old. Granted, they've chosen to be in engineering, but they're not that much different than high school, you know, than reasonably smart high school students. And that's all, that's all the system really needs to know in order to be able to facilitate them doing that. And this is, again, this comes back to Robert's to Robert's question, right? You could imagine when we set out to do this at first, right, our concern was that you would need to write 200 different rules for every possible situation that could come up while that was, while students were doing that. Um, it turns out, well, you can count, it's uh, 15 rules and that counts everything, the assessment of the products, the email that tells you what to do at the beginning, all that stuff. Um, and it turns out that something on the order of uh, 60 to 75 percent of what the mentors do, at least the, in the old system, this we may get we're going to expect to get higher numbers from this um, revision, was straight off of this script. Right. So 15 rules, right, covers 75 percent of the cases. Now, granted, the last right. The last 25% of the cases might be another 40 rules or, some, or something, but it, it's an empirical question. When we started out, I don't know that I would have told you that you'd get 80% of the way there with 15 rules. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, this, is, this is sort of the, the ongoing question is, you know, um, we talk about it as a, um, you're familiar with the idea of like a, a, if a balloon isn't all the way filled with air and you squeeze it in one place, the balloon bulges out somewhere else. Well, essentially what we have is, think about the, the ill-formed nature of the domain, the uncertainty about how you should solve the problem as being like a, this balloon. And what we're doing is progressively kind of wrapping structure around the balloon and the part that's ill-formed, right, the part that, that we don't have a set of, of good rules gets sort of, sort of squeezed further and further down. And eventually the question is, can you squeeze enough of it out that the parts that are still unformed are in that gray area that I don't, I don't know, I don't know your name, but that we were talking about before, that is the gray area where 
even if it was a real person, the real person wouldn't necessarily respond to that particular question or wouldn't respond well or would say, does anybody else know or would ignore it or whatever. Right? And that's, an, again, an empirical question as to whether or not you can sort of through this progressive process get it to the place where the, the things that aren't handled with some structure don't matter anyway. Right? Um, and so far... When I started this, and by this I mean the progressive construction of the, this, this version of the system, my answer was actually no. I didn't think you would ever get to the place where you would always need somebody in the loop and that the complexity of the domain was going to be such that you could only ever sort of scaffold what somebody did. Um, I become more and more persuaded that that, is, that may not be true empirically. That you, you're never going to get a perfect model, but that the model may get close enough that it essentially will pass whatever the learning sciences version of the Turing test is, meaning it, it's good enough for government work, as we say. Um, a nice example of that is that so that when we first when we first did these games, they were live action role playing games, meaning. The students were still working in teams and they were working as journalists or whatever, but there was actually, the mentor was actually in the room and the mentor had a script. It was actually, some of it was written out, but it was much looser and they were, you know, interacting as if the students were real journalists. And um, we encountered the problem, what was your name again? Marie-Louise. Marie-Louise. The problem that Marie-Louise Marie was asking about, which is the data problem, right? How do you study something like that? Well, we had the mentors where tie clip mics and record all the conversations that they had. So we, we didn't even get a complete record of all the conversations because we only had the conversations the mentors were involved in. And as it was, the students were, you know, th they were stringing nooses up in the office because they, they had so much data that they had to transcribe and then code, right? Um, so we said, well, given the technology we have, why don't we just do everything online through chat? And we did it not because we thought it was pedagogically a good idea. We did it because that was the only way to get the data. <laughs> so it was entire, like I confess, it was entirely driven by, you know, our desire to make our lives easier. Um, and we had long conversations in my research group about what, whether, whether that was even feasible. Whether you could have a group of high school students, uh, secondary school students, Entirely working on chat, and keep in mind this is, you know, mid-2000s, right? So it's, what the question wasn't as goofy as it sounds now, but um, whether they could actually all be working together in chat and not, you know, stray off, search on YouTube, do whatever it is that they were going to do. And we, were ta we talked about the number of times that the mentor would have to check in. How often would you have to check in to keep them on track? And so we essentially said, well, let's just try it and see. So we built the first system, and uh, we actually ran it in, uh, in, the, in Milwaukee, in the inner city, um, with a group of hand-selected students, meaning the Milwaukee <coughs> Public Schools selected the students because they were kids who weren't doing well in school. They were goofing off, and they were coming to this afternoon club as their punishment. It's great. Just the students you want to be testing your system with the first time, right? Um, and, and so they all they sat down, and they logged into the system. And we had, an obser we had a, one of our researchers observing in the room. And she said it was spooky. This, the room was completely quiet. The students were completely absorbed in the game. Um, and the, uh, there were adults who had come to visit. And they were all talking in hush. The adults were the only people talking. They were talking in hush voices. None of them could quite believe that these kids were sitting quietly, you know, working at the computer. And then apparently on the second day, so the, in schools in the United States, the computers are, are locked down, meaning you, you're, you can't access certain internet sites, and so maybe you do the same thing here, right? Um, so the, on our site wasn't on the whitelist. So the only way that the students could play was if the administrator <coughs> logged on, which meant now they were using completely unlocked computers in their school. And of course, one of the students realized this and realized that they could get to YouTube. <laughs> and so the word went around the room that they could get to YouTube. And all the students went to YouTube, 
and then went back to the meeting. And we, you know, we were shocked. We had, we had no expectation that that was going to be what happened. Um, and it turns out that in some ways the fictional world of the game was more powerful when it was being done through the computer than when there was somebody standing in the room. Which makes sense in retrospect because if I'm 15 years old and somebody shows up at my school and says, I'm an architect and we're going to be working as architects now, I go, yeah, sure. Right. If on the other hand I'm communicating with somebody through something that looks like the architect's company's website and I'm getting email from a boss and I, you know, if all this stuff is happening and I'm chatting with somebody, I can imagine that they're really at their architecture firm and that they're doing a lot of other stuff that real architects do, whatever that is, and they're also communicating with me. Um, and so, sort of, you know, progressively along the way, th this is a good example of one of those places where my best bet was going to be that we were going to have a lot more problems than we did. And that um, I become sort of more convinced that, uh, that the, the, what it takes to make a model like this work is not necessarily recreating all of the features that we're, we're used to in, an edu in a pedagogical environment. And what that means is we don't have to solve the AI complete problem. We don't actually have to simulate realistic characters. We probably have to do a better job than most computer games do today. Right? The AI in computer games is really pretty lousy still. Um, this is doing a better job of it in part because there's a human. But the question is how far do we have to go in order to get far enough um, and I think it may not be as far as we think. Um, and that if, if, I was, if I was being forced to bet, I would bet that it's doable. I can't tell you all the pieces it's going to take, but, um, you know, it took us uh, four years of work on the system to get to the point where the th three features that I just described, the um, one that I showed you, which is tracking the reflective conversation, the auto caching of the answers to que to questions and the um, automated evaluation of the products it took us four years actually to figure out that those were the right features to add value to the mentors and how to do them. Um, but I'm pretty convinced now that those are actually going to take things up a, a big step in terms of the mentor's ability to run this and. We actually completely revised the interface. The mentors used to have two different screens and they would track one thing over here and one thing over here and the they weren't using the suggestions because they were coming in the wrong place. So there's, it's not that it's trivial to get it to work, um, but there's, there's still even more ground that we can, that we can make towards, uh, towards, getting, towards getting where we need to go, um, which I think makes it very exciting. Um, and just as a pitch, you know, we're now at the place where um, well, probably by this time next year we will have the uh, uh, game creation system so that it's easy to put together the content for the game. But even now, if somebody wanted to say, well, we'd like to build a game about X, right? If, you, if you're willing to learn some, a little bit about how our system works, you could actually put together the game and just run it. We, you, know, we don't, we don't have to, you don't have to be a programmer to, to run it. And so one of the things that we're hoping to do is find collaborators who are interested in trying this out in new domains and then saying, hey, you know, in this domain we actually need this other feature um, and starting to triangulate to get to see whether there are other things that we can build in to kind of get that last 20% of the way or 25% or whatever it is. Sorry, another long answer to a, uh, to a good question, but yeah. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the system, what we have been seeing, it's based on, on writing, mostly. Are there supported for images and videos? And uh, yeah, or? so, yes. So, um, uh, there are a few, so yeah, you can put any resource you want in there. In fact, there is a video that I just didn't show, but they, it's the intro video, so the head of the company welcomes you and introduces you to, your, to, the, to this uh, person who's going to be your mentor and so on. Um, interestingly, we, uh, we've used our own graduate students as the characters in that video, and so sometimes they get stopped on campus. Somebody says, hey, are you were a manager. Um, <laughs> so we've stopped doing that, we now hire actors. But, um, uh, so yeah, the, the, it's 
it, it can take, for example, you can put a PDF in as resources or you can put in HTML. It does, again, it doesn't really care what the, what the content is. Um, the other question that we sometimes get is, um, you know, what about, so the, the biggest rate limiting step for students is um, literacy. So students who don't read fast or don't write well struggle with the system like this, which means that you can only go down to a certain age. We've gone as low as about fifth grade, which would be like 10 or 11 year olds in the United States, much below that, and they can't, they can't keep up. Um, the technology is just about there. Um, it's not, I, I think, personally, I think it's not quite where you could, where a student could speak into the system and have it transcribed and then, you know, like a, a dragon speak is one program. Most of them require a little more training than you're likely to be able to do in a realistic context. Um, but that's, that's not far away either. And you could certainly auto-generate the speech from what the system is saying or you could record it in advance. Um, we, we didn't go down that route um, uh, in part because we thought that it would, until the systems got really good at doing that, it would make it less realistic. So that if things are just appearing in text and in email, I mean, let's face it, um, who was I talking to? Stefan's student who says, oh, was, was, yeah, it was you, right. Yeah, uh, all of your communications with him are in text, right? Yeah, so, so it's because if he's not around, you communicate an email. You, nobody, nobody sends video chats to each other. Um, so it, in some sense, it's, it's more realistic. Um, there are, now, the other, you were just sort of nodding, and of course, there's the question of you know, video conferencing, and did we want to, do, did we want to go through video conferencing? Um, the reason we didn't do that is that um, then it's really hard for one mentor to, to monitor multiple chats unless you are somehow having an avatar for the mentor and then you kind of get into uncanny valley where the accuracy of the man, right? So you essentially introduce a whole host of uh, problems. The students uh, at first would complain that it was easier for them to have a conversation among each other if they were all sitting in the same place than to be chatting. And of course, that meant we couldn't track it in the system and it meant the mentor couldn't hear what they were talking about. So there actually was a legitimate reason to have them do it on chat, right? You know, you want your design advisor to be part of your conversation. But the simpler solution, it turned out, was just to say that they don't have to come to class. They can log in from anywhere they want, um, which they like because then they can stay in their, ho in their dorm room or they can go to a coffee shop and they can, you know, at 10 o'clock, they log in and they do their course. Um, and of course, now, well, you're not in the same place, so there's no temptation to have a face-to-face -face conversation. You're all chatting anyway. Um, uh, so between that and the prevalence of uh, SMS, um, I think that we, that sort of the, real, the realism of that has gone up. Has, has gone up. Um, but that's one thing that we're, we've been thinking about is the what's the right modality, which I think is sort of behind your question. But I'm thinking about because of the Robert's work on, on sketching mm -hmm. in, in, inside the, the engineer, how do, you, do they share kind of their, their work if they are kind of drawing something? Yep, like so the, the particular simulations that we've put together don't, in, <coughs> don't so far involve them actually doing freehand sketching. Mm -hmm. um, but a way to think about that is... But also, you, you know, you know, I'm thinking about digital sketching. As well. Yeah, no, right. I, I, I mean, I understood that you were, I understood that. I, okay. The... A way to think about that is that that goes right in here, okay. right? So right now the design problem that they're working on is a relatively discrete problem. They choose from a set of options and they're trying to understand which of those options in the prototypes are going to produce the most desirable outcomes. If you had a, a different and more sophisticated design simulation in which they were working, that just becomes an object that the system has access to. And as long as that object has whatever properties are known that are important for the simulation to know about, that it passes through the API, the application protocol interface, I think that's what it stands for, um, right, then we don't care what's actually in that object. So, you, so for example, in the urban planning game, they're actually uh, redesigning a, a city. And they, the city is divided into parcels and they can choose zoning in the city. And, right, so that's a much different, much more interactive uh, domain simulation that they're working on, and it's just an it's just an object, in the, um, as far as the game is concerned. So those could be arbitrarily complex according to the domain. And when we used to do journalism, they had journalism stories, which is a 
very different kind of object again. When we did uh, graphic design, you had a graphic piece of graphic design. It works the same way. Yeah. yeah in terms of the content that you have put in the system, um, does it equal a course? Does it equal a task? What is, you yeah, know, right. So the Nefertex game that you saw, the, we, what we found is something on the order of 15 hours worth of activity is a, is a reasonable chunk. We've done longer, we've done shorter, but we seem to keep coming back to that as kind of a good modal amount. Um, that represents about half of a university course. Um, and actually, um, well, just yesterday, uh, we launched the first all simulation-based freshman engineering course where there are essentially two of these simulations they do. Uh, they do them back to back. There's a few things the university requires. They have an introduction to the library or something like that. Um, but other than that, they're all in the, they're in the virtual simulations. Um, so yeah, what we were doing in the past was we just had one and we would drop it in as part of the course. We actually moved to, we, we wanted to have at least two because people tend to adopt a course rather than figuring out how to fit something into their course. Um, you know, ideally you'd want to have a menu of three or four or five or six that students could choose from, any two from, as part of an introductory course, but, you know, it takes a little bit of time and money to build them, so we're starting small. But yeah, that's about the scale. And people have done them over two weeks in class, people have done them with younger kids over, you know, over a vacation, come in and work, you know, five hours a day for three days, stuff like that. So it doesn't really matter how the 15 hours is broken up. Do you get an examination of what they have been learning in the system? Yeah, so there's a, there's a, we call it the, a, an exit interview and an entrance, inter or an entrance interview and an exit interview, but essentially it's a pre and post test mm -hmm. and it's built into the system. And again, you could configure that however you want it as well. It's a fairly minor detail, but I, I was wondering when you talked about stereotypes mm -hmm. uh, between men and women and collaboration, did you actually measure collaboration itself or how much they talked about it? <coughs> that's, that's something that was on my mind because you said, you know, oh, women talk less and men talk more about it, but maybe it's the fact that men are not. So yeah. So, so they have to talk more about it to figure it out. Yes, that is possible. I mean, so yeah. technically what we're measuring is the, so this is a, this is a, uh, you could call it either semantic proximity or semantic co-occurrence model. Um, so the idea is that we're, um, we're measuring the way in which the parts of the engineering domain are connected to one another. Mm -hmm. One of the parts that gets measured is the scale of collaboration. And I forget exactly what this keyword set for that is, but it's, um, it's gonna be things like uh, group, I think, is in there and um, uh, probably email is in there. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it is. But there's a set of, of keywords that cue that something collaborative is happening. Okay. And then because it's skill, there actually has to be, uh, the way that the skill code is, is operationalized is there has to be a, a verb that has a person as its subject. Hmm. So somebody has to be doing something. Okay. in order for it to be coded as a skill. So it's at least trying to measure actual collaboration. Well, it's trying to measure, so it's trying to, it would pick up something like, I am going to send an email, assuming, for example, email is in the collaboration queue, right? Whereas if it, if the, it said, the system sent me an email, would count, okay? Um, so yes, there's an, so skill of collaboration is attempting to measure the talk about collaboration. Now, what we haven't done, but could do, is, for example, um, code the number of um, questions that one player directs at another and count each of those acts as an example of a skill of collaboration. We could code the number of peer-to-peer uh, -peer emails or code a peer-to-peer -peer email as an act of collaboration. We haven't chosen to do it, but that's because we're working on the simplest model we can to start with, right? But that would be easy enough to do. So that's the first step is to identify these uh, points in time when collaboration is being invoked by whatever definition. But the way the model works is, and if you go back, let me go to uh, the actual data that I showed. Just give me one sec. Um, oh, there it is. So if you look here, 
This is actually, this, these are stanzas, and for those of you who do discourse analysis, a stanza, think about a stanza in a poem. It's a set of lines that are related to one another. In this case, we've defined the room as a stanza. So within one room, within one activity structure, everything that gets said and done is, by definition, related to everything else. So in this case, this is stanza 11, right, which is, corresponds to room 11, in this case in the game, and this is all the discourse, and in this case it's just this one player's discourse. So it's, a, it's sort of a, the model, is, this part of the model is a little funky because this is leaving out of this player's coding all of the things that this player was responding to. There are other ways to make the model that would take that into account. The one I ran when I put the slides together doesn't happen to do that. These ellipses actually represent, there, these ellipses represent other turns of talk that are not being shown, but are, uh, and are not being shown because there are no codes in them, I guess is the right way to put that. Um, so what you're seeing here is that this is the skill of data, but we could imagine that was the skill of collaboration. What we're measuring is the co-occurrence of collaboration with something else. So in other words, simply saying I'm going to send an email, again, assuming that counts as collaboration, doesn't get you, doesn't get recorded in the model. It only gets recorded if it's present with something else from the domain. So in other words, I have to be collaborating about something that is consequential in the domain. Right? Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, now, again, that's, that's a model that's been constructed a, on, a, on a series of assumptions about what the nature of the semantics of the domain are. You could make other assumptions you could make other assumptions in terms of what qualifies as collaboration. You could make other assumptions as to how that collaboration gets included in the model. In this case, it's a co-occurrence model, meaning it has to occur with something else. What that means in terms of the structure of the data is that so this thick line right, means that epistemology of data and skill of data are more tightly, more tightly connected than say these thin lines, skill of professionalism and epistemology of design, right? Just means that they, they happen together more. Um, to say that, um, that collaboration is up here is not actually about the location of that point. The way to think about it is that the model is actually taking into account the weight of these lines. This point is where it is over here because the, this point represents the center of mass of this object in, in high dimensional space. And in fact, if, let me say this right, in the original high dimensional space of all these matrices, right, this figure's center of mass is exactly where this point is. Because everything's been projected down into, in this case, two dimensions, it's not exact, right? No, you wouldn't expect that. But what this is essentially doing is giving you the center of mass representation of this versus the center of mass representation of that. That's why these two points are close together in this space because, in fact, the center of mass of this is somewhere right in here, and the center of mass of this is somewhere right in here, right? Which tells us that, in fact, there's another dimension that we need to consider, which is part of, it's not in the public release version, right? Which is the overall density of the network. That's the actual, that's the real story here. You want to project out into the third dimension, the density of the network, in which case what you would see is the green dots would all come like this, and the red dots would be like that. That would get you the real separation, right? Um, <coughs> but each of these is still representing the semantics. So what's happening is the skill of collaboration means that these lines, are, matters when these lines are thick, because that's going to tend to weigh, on average, everything up towards this side, which is going to pull the center of mass up that way. Does that make sense? Well, it does, yeah. Thanks for explaining. Yeah, it's, because it's not just points that are happening, but it's the connections that matter with something Right, else. So, so it's so these lines. It's closer to actual collaboration. Yes, yeah. right, so it's the lines. Um, yeah, that model took us about three years to figure out how to, uh, how to construct, and then it's the, the interpretation of it that, um, that, that took a while. Just, that was the mathematics I was referring to the other day, by the way. So it turns out that if you take, 
Now nah, you guys don't care about that. It's a, it's a fun, it's a fun <laughs> mathematical story, but I'll, I'll tell it over lunch or something. I'm not going to waste everybody's time. It's to do with what you do in, with 200 vectors in a high dimensional space. Nobody cares about that. Um, <laughs> other questions? And we leave it for now, and uh, you know, we'll come back to the workshop later on in six months. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Those are great questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>